rumors out there about social media. Is it good? Is it bad? Uh, high expectations? Wrong expectations? So we decided to invite these three experts and do some, yeah, let's call it myth busting. What is in fact true? What is empirically proven? And that's uh, uh, the idea behind this just one hour panel. Um, we start with three introductory uh, 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 presentations, just of 10 minutes, so each uh, uh, of them makes their point, and then we start with a discussion, and I'll show you a few uh, statements we prepared, and they respond first to a statement, and then I'm going around with the mic, so uh, we want to have uh, uh, as much interactivity as possible, so uh, if you have questions or ideas or remarks or you agree or don't agree, please raise your hand. I will be coming with a microphone and we can have a lively debate because it, it has to be a debate. I start, of course, with Professor Elsbeth Korsgaard Sorensen from Denmark. She is Professor in Digital Communication and Learning and Head of uh, the Research Unit, an expert in, in uh, learning uh, in technology, her CV is that big. Uh, I keep it uh, to, to, to this. Maybe you can tell a little bit more uh, about yourself uh, just later on. Then we continue with uh, Professor Koen de Prijk, professor at the Vrije Universiteit in Brussels. Oh, okay, because we have to switch machines. Uh, Kurt Bonk will be a second, so then uh, I introduce. Kurt. Kurt Bonk is, of course, is very well known at, at media and AACE conferences. He has been a keynote speaker for, for many, many years at our conferences, and uh, he's professor at Indiana University, um, uh, teaches psychology and technology courses. He published so much uh, publications and books. Um, we are yeah, we're glad that he could come and uh, join our panel here. And the last person who will uh, start, uh, or will be last, that's uh, Kunde Praik, professor at the Vrije Universiteit in Brussels. Um, his focus is on, on ICT, research, fieldwork, and consulting uh, uh, in the field of education and uh, computers. Um, and uh, he's the vice chairman of FILOF, that's the Flemish Association for Teacher Trainers. So again, a different perspective, I think, on social media. Um, we are not going to waste uh, any time, so I ask Elspeth uh, to start with her introductory short presentation of 10 minutes. Thank you. I'm, I apologize. This is not my machine, so I don't know how to open <laughs> it. Anyway. <clears throat> and I also apologize because my voice is disappearing. <laughs> and you always have a time when you see yeah. So I move it here. Okay. I am going to be talking to you. I will, sh of course, I can expand a little bit more about myself, but I think on the other hand that um, that can be read in the introduction online, and I think that we should use the time here for what we planned. Anyway, um, I'm from Denmark, from Aalborg University, and uh, I'm working with the uh, integration of technology in education, both in practice and in research. So what I'll be talking about here, I'll be saying a little bit about my research focus, and because that helps shaping my perspective when we talk about social media. And then I'm going to talk about what I see as the potential of social media. Uh, and then last, a little bit about some concerns that I have. I'm I am very interested in the building of identity of democratic values, participation and empowerment. And building of, of an, a democratic identity, I think it's a responsibility of the education. And it's uh, in a global perspective, I think it's, it's very important. <clears throat> so that means learning through interaction because it's about discussing, it's about negotiation uh, and through uh, democratic collaborative knowledge building online. 
I'm interested in, in the concept of reflection because I think it's pertinent too. Otherwise, we cannot speak about learning if we cannot need to reflect on what we are actually doing. And I'm interested in the collaborative production of knowledge, but not just the known knowledge, but I'm interested in utilizing technology for, to support the generation of collaboratively built new knowledge. And then I'm interested in digital support for inclusion. How can we use the technology for a better purpose in a global perspective again? We have a responsibility as designers of education because we will help shape and form the individuals that are uh, we're, uh, living in our globe, so to speak, and how can we coexist peacefully and so on and so on. And I'm therefore also interested in, it's not enough to have a dialogue. We have lots of dialogue. We have uh, Facebook and all sorts of dialogues that goes on all the time, but how can we qualify that dialogue so it actually comes to work for knowledge building because not any diverging dialogue will do so. And then finally, I'm interested, I'm coming from Aalborg, which is a PVL university. I'm very interested in uh, seeing how can these technologies support this concept. And also digital portfolios as tools for enhancing this collaborative knowledge building online. Um, so, summing up, I'm interested in creating creative uh, learning designs that really support innovation, creativity, and empowerment, because that's what is needed in a democratic uh, existence, coexistence, and as such, the identity building as a democratic world citizen. So, what is the claimed potential of social media? Well, Terry Anderson did a very nice uh, um, definition of this. So, what I put in red is important. That gives a collaborative idea. And what I highlighted with black is it's about time, space, presence, activity, identity, and relationships. That's, those are important ingredients in becoming an empowered learner and citizen. So, um, network tools, as he says, Terry Anderson, we have lots of them. And he says um, that social software actually invites open-ended learning environments. I have a little problem here, can I? Okay. So, so social software provides us with opportunities for supporting, or, oh, sorry about this. Supporting values like uh, you have, you can see here in the slide, authenticity, empowerment, and inclusion built on diversity, non-authoritarian approaches, participation, democratic dialogic attitudes, creativity, the you know the play between local and global, and then dialogue. It's very good to support dialogue and collaboration. And reflection and meta reflection. And so it's really, it seems that there's a great potential in social software from my point of view, for all that I have been talking about that I, that I uh, prioritize in, in this. It can be put uh, a little bit like this. You can look at it for that there are potential for organizing communicative learning processes and there are potentials 
for organizing learning resources, so processes and products, uh, possibility for learner participation, learner collaboration, uh, digital resources for co-construction, co-designing, for rejecting the one-size-fits-all uh, idea, uh, and so on. So, from a perspective of building identity and learning with a focus on dialogue and participation, uh, <clears throat> I would point your attention to Linda Stone, who some time ago, though, admittedly, coined the term continuous partial attention. This is just to understand the, the effect of social media on us before we start using the media. So <clears throat> she's saying for almost two decades, continuous partial attention has been a way of life to cope and keep up with responsibilities and relationships. We've stretched our attention bands with bandwidth to upper limits. We think that if tech has a lot of bandwidth, then we do too. With continuous partial attention, we keep the top level item in focus and scan the periphery in case something more important emerges right now. <clears throat> so she, she talks about this three cycle where there are different centers of gravity. One, the, once it was authority that put the mark, another time it was self expression, me, me, and me, and then we are in the time now where network, networks are centers of gravity. So dialogue, I'm jumping this a little quick, uh, includes both post-personal gestures and tones of voice. Engagement in dialogue is a way to change ourselves and our focus, therefore, social media, if we want to use them in education. Let's look for how well they support this. But certainly Stone seemed to um, be a little bit uh, um, critical against where that's possible. This is my final slide. And I'm asking the question, not really terribly convinced of one or the other, but I can see that technology really uh, uh, influences us. Just look at your colleagues, young people on the street, they walk the street with a cell phone. We are having dinner together with our cell phone and so on. Is it possible, I'm asking, using social software to teach students how to construct new knowledge together with others so that they can participate more fully and effectively in ongoing dialogues and not just be concerned with fixed knowledge or what we also call facts? If that is the case, then our first and prime concern should be to engage students in our designs, to engage students in sustained stretches of talk. And this is an expression that I'm uh, learning from Wegerich, which enables speakers and listeners to explore and build on their own and others' ideas in the course of collaboratively producing new insight. So th these are just some inspirations that I used, and thank you. So over to you, Chris. Okay, good, it's your turn, thank you. One, two, three. Yeah. Test, test. It's moving. Test one. You turn it off. Test one, two, three. There we go. Uh, social media use for learning and development. Um, I've done research on blogging and research on um, Twitter now, and but I decided not to present my research. My doctoral student, uh, Maina Ju, and I have been team teaching a class on emerging technologies for three or four years now. She's been my TA. We've mined that class for what other people are saying. So I'm going to summarize what other people say about the research on <coughs> social media. 
here, if you go to my homepage, kurtfunk.com, you can get that monster syllabus. It has AR, VR, eBooks, online learning, has 75 pages of everything. Um, so anyways, we'll summarize that here in a bit. How many of you use social media, or how many of you have posted to a social media account since arriving in Amsterdam? How many since arriving at this session? Because you're bored with me. Okay, yeah, it's honesty. How many since this morning have posted somewhere? Okay. Uh, how many are fi have fidgetal students, kids, students like me, who can't focus, right? Okay. Um, this is the fidgetal age, phys physical and digital. How many have a blog? I have a blog, Travel and Edman. My friend Aaron Daring from University of Minnesota, where they talk funny up there, he has a blog too uh, called Ch Chasing Seals. And Aaron's a frequent guest at Ed Media and eLearn and other places. You can see some of his blog posts. How many of you have a Twitter account? A Twitter account too. You can see Aaron's Twitter account. I follow Aaron on Twitter. He's the only one I follow in the world because he talks about climate change things. And you can see some things that he's been publishing lately uh, on climate change and his. He's been interviewed by many uh, CNN and many places for his blog and his Twitter account and other things and his adventures around the world. This is his most recent Twitter post from June 15th. How many of you subscribe to a Twitter account? How many of you know about this Twitter account? CNN and MSNBC are fake news. How many subscribe? <laughs> the dishonest media did not explain Okay, so we do have something at Indiana University called Hoaxy, which analyzes fake news. We have designed some software to help students understand what fake news is. Uh, and that's the gentleman who's in charge of that project on social media at Indiana. Uh, and there's, they're doing a demonstration of it. I mean, let's go into the research that's been done. Some of the research that's been done is general overviews of the research. For instance, looking at um, higher education social media, or um, looking at analysis of microblogging by my friend Fei Gao and Ka Zhang. I'm gonna come back to their study in a little bit. Some people have looked at analyzing all the research and design frameworks. So my friend Nada Dabal, and one of her students is here. One of Nada's students said she might come. Yeah, there she is in the back. Nada's looked at <clears throat> all the social media research out there and looking at self-regulated learning and designed three levels of support for students that you can see in here for blogs and wikis <clears throat> and other types of social media and what you might do at level one, two, and three. My notes are downloadable at trainingshare.com. You don't have to take a picture of anything unless you want to take a picture of me late, no, um, or buy me a drink. Anyhow, so um, you know, take, take that trainingshare.com or go to kurtbunk.com archive talks. My colleague, Bei Wen Chen from University of C C Central Florida, the largest university in Florida, you might not know that, Cent uh, other than Ohio State, people might know. Central Florida and is bigger than Florida and Florida State. She's doing research there because they do a lot of stuff online. That's the best place for training faculty in the world. And as they're looking at social media and how it uh, can be used for informal to bring people into formal environments and some of their research. She's done so much research that during AERA two months ago, I flew actually to New York to meet with her and talk to her at the Met. You can see my picture right there to get her perspectives. I knew I was gonna do this talk and here's some of the guidelines that she said. Um, be sure to use, use social media as tools to facilitate informal discussions with clear goals. Use social media as an optional tool inside and outside classes and give them alternative assignments if they don't want to do it. Don't mandate what faculty are going to do. Um, you know, rather than institutional requirements, let's let, let ins train instructors and let them decide. Other people are doing research on the comparison of students and faculty. Uh, this particular study in Computers and Human Behavior showed that students are very positive about their beliefs of social media. Faculty, on the other hand, are a little bit more resistant and reluctant. They're sporadic in their use. Uses by students um, on their own learning purposes seems to be abundant, but also incidental and informal. And that's not too surprising, it's a dull kind of finding. Let's look at Facebook a little bit here. Um, my friend Rayo Junko, who came into my class about 2011 um, using Adobe Connect at the time, we now use Zoom, uh, he does Twitter and Facebook researches and he looks at the types of things that students are doing in Facebook and is very quantitative in his analysis. So he's got 2,368 college students. Facebook use is negatively predictive of their grades and their engagement in the class. The more you're in Facebook, the less, the worse you do. Now there's some dependencies there. Um, time spent on Facebook strongly negatively correlated with GPA. Another study that he did in 2011 
um, using Facebook for collecting and sharing information was positively predictive. So if you collect and share, which isn't as much as the others, um, socializing is negatively predictive, okay? Um, another study that he's done, seniors spent significantly less time on Facebook and spent significantly less time multitasking. Time on Facebook is negatively predictive GPA again, but um, for freshmen, sophomores, and juniors. Seniors got smart by the end, they know they had to get done, and so therefore they did. And you can see the charts that are in his article there. And you can download all, remember, you can download my slides and click to all these articles and get all of them. He's also done some Twitter research. And so he's looked at uh, first year um, seminar class. Um, he had an experimental group, had a significantly greater increase in engagement than the control group, as well as higher GPA scores. So Twitter had more benefits than Facebook. I'm not too surprised by that, but it's important for someone to do that kind of a study. And he's got some other evidence about engagement of students. And if you look over here in the corner, you can see the significance for engagement, significance for GPA, experimental over control group, and you can look at the number of postings over time. You notice that by the time he had, he had done this Facebook research, he still had hair. By the time he got to the, so to the Twitter research, he had lost all his hair. Um, I'm not saying that that causes us to lose hair, but be careful. Um, he did another study of Twitter where he had a model for pedagogy. And that model, um, pedagogically, theoretically driven pedagogical model requiring students to use Twitter had some benefits, requiring it as opposed to making it optional. Having a model for faculty and faculty modeling how they're using Twitter, not just students using Twitter, was very important. This gentleman here won an award for some of his research on social media, and he found a positive correlation between Twitter usage and student engagement in a study in the British Journal of Ed Tech two years ago, Chris Evans, Twitter for Teaching and he found a positive correlation, but he found that Twitter usage didn't impact attendance. So it's a, you know, it's a mixed, method, mixed results in effect. Other people have looked at what they're doing when they're in Twitter, in microblogging environments. Are they doing social tweets? Are they relating life experiences? Are they mainly doing assignment related kinds of things? And so they've analyzed in the category schemes what they're actually doing and analyzing. I have one minute left. And so some, mostly assignment related things, but not all are assignment related kinds of things. Other people have looked at Twitter, is it a direct instruction, a communication tool, does it provide fast access? Uh, most find that Twitter helps engage with your professor and gets you prepared for your career um, and gets you excited about your career. Again, I mentioned Fei Gao and, and Kao Zhang had done several studies, and Fei has done a series of studies on microblogging and finds that it encourages engagement and participation and other things. They've expanded their work and looked at what disciplines are now doing um, research on uh, social media and tweeting, in particular language learning, instructional design, new media, uh, and what kinds of things are they using for data sources are analyzed in their study as well. Faye has continued to do her work in looking at um, e-chat Twitter posts, uh, communities of educators. In a study in 2017, about half of all members tweeted only once. The majority had limited connections with others. And you can see she's done some social network analyses in her work, looked at the types of tweets. She's looked at when they're tweeting. And she's looked at the um, why, what, when, where, and how of tweeting, in effect. Um, she's now got an article that's being submitted. We're looking at 600,000 tweets. Um, I'll let you read a little bit more about that if you download my notes. I think I'm out of time. Um, the tweets revealed uh, that the kind of interaction do domains were more important than the social domains in terms of student engagement. The last person that I want to just mention is George Valencianos, who's also a friend of Ed Media, was an invited speaker here two years ago. He's done a series of studies on scholars, um, um, faculty scholarship using social media like Twitter and what they're doing in terms of sharing, requesting information, networking, and other things. And he's done some stuff looking at 600,000 tweets, 237 faculty, and what they're doing within their tweeting. So read George Felicianos, read Fei Gao, read people like Vanessa Denon from Florida State, uh, read Bei Wen Chen from Central Florida, uh, and that, that kind of thing. So um, the final study of, of, and I'm out of time here, but there's some future directions and where this research needs to go. Um, but George also looked at social media in MOOCs and found that uh, it wasn't always that effective using Twitter within MOOCs. So uh, again, my, my grad student, Maina Ju, and I have done, put together this little slideshow to give you a sense of what they're saying in Facebook, Twitter, and other social medias. And I hope you learned a little bit about the current 
status of all that. So we're going to switch computers here and move it over to our third presenter. Um, ten minutes, that's a lot of time. And at the same time, I would like uh, a couple more. Um, let me try to, to really focus on what I would like to present here today as a way of looking at um, how social media and uh, learning um, interact. Um, and just in that from the presentation of the panel, um, influence of social media on learning and development, that's a very broad, 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 broad uh, topic. And so one of the things I would like to do is, uh, is raise this question. How generic can we be when we try to address it? Um, can we just talk about social media as if it is a single thing? Can we talk about learning as if it's a single thing? Can we talk about development? Um, I'm doing work a bit all over the globe, and I noticed that uh, so even social media means, not, it's, not, it's not like just here in, in, in Amsterdam or Brussels where you have all these different tools, but when you're in the middle of the Amazon fo forest, there are social media, but just for lack of internet uh, bandwidth, that concept really means something very, very different from what it means like in Suriname, where I do a lot of work, uh, in the capital of the city. Even there it's difficult, but it's a different um, concept. One of my all-time favorites in terms of research is, is this one. The effects of graduate teaching at assistant attire on student learning misbehaviors and readings of instruction. I mean, this is such a detailed research question, and yet it, it sort of gives us really specific um, information. So I would like to sort of uh, juxtapose this to the very general question, what's, what about the interaction of social media and learning and development? Um, okay, some fundamental research, basically, Google, learning, and you get this uh, almost taxonomy of what learning is about, and it sort of gives you an overview of uh, different aspects of uh, learning that we've identified in, in, in research and that's sort of part of our vocabulary and we're looking at that. And so when we are addressing the question of the interaction, the influence of social learning on uh, social media on learning, we're actually talking on the effect of social media on all of, uh, on all of these different uh, concepts. And again, it's not just a single thing. And I guess this one, active learning, is one of the effects we are hoping for. Can we sort of use social media to activate our learnings to learners to bring them into the learning uh, process? And on the other hand, uh, meaningful learning, uh, basically the, idea, the concept that learning has to do with uh, understanding how one concept relates to others and, and how that works. That's the one we're perhaps most afraid of when we're talking about uh, the influence of social media on uh, learning and development. That's the one we are afraid we're going to lose when we put too much stress on, too much focus on, uh, on social uh, learning. Um, Partly because in at least some traditions, and especially the academic tradition, we assume this meaningful learning to be learning to be learning. That's what learning is about, as if all those other aspects of learning are sort of marginal precursors, some things in the margin but have nothing to do with real learning. Real learning must be meaningful learning. If that's our definition of meaningful learning, then of course a lot of what's going on in social media is not going to be uh, real learning. So, um, and again, it's also in that description of the, of the panel, social media is sort of on the one hand connected to um, uh, this almost machine, like yes, it's social, it's interactive, but it's sort of grinding us through this social aspect, not going to the deep learning, so we're sort of brainwashed by social media. And on the other hand, there's this image of social media uh, contributing to this idyllic uh, context for learning, where people are autonomous at the same time, interact with each other, 
uh, and so there's this sort of uh, two uh, extreme visions on um, on how uh, social media can have an effect on learning. But again, so it depends to a large extent extent on how uh, on how you define uh, learning. What I find in my own uh, research and my own work with students and, and, and colleagues is that most interesting results are actually highly specific and contextualized. This is from uh, a PhD, uh, one of our students at uh, the university, who did a research on unraveling adult learner related factors and the social and interactional aspects of the blended learning environment contributing to their learning performance and social outcomes. This is getting a little bit closer to the, uh, student, uh, the student assistant attire and she's looking at something very uh, specific and asking this very specific question. What's the relationship between online interaction quality and adults learning performance? So, and of course she goes into detail about what she means by online interaction quality and what's specific about adult learner, uh, adult learning compared to uh, teenager learning and uh, stuff like that. And just to give you the shortcuts, what she comes up with in her work is an understanding, okay, deep learning, uh, meaningful learning, that social media help building social capital, and that's the social capital that enables adult learner. So instead of having sort of a direct, looking at the direct influence from social media, she's finding how social media has an, has an effect, but again, social media is not the only thing that could have that effect. So basically what it boils down to is, okay, how can social media now compare to other ways, how can we now design uh, practice? And I think that's the way uh, to go. So I would just like to present sort of a, a flipped panel here. So instead of just looking at the influence of social media on learning and development, I would suggest that we also look at the influence of learning and development on social media. Uh, basically, um, going back to this sort of taxonomy of all the things that are related to, uh, to uh, uh, learning and development and then see how they, true teachers, can have an effect on social media. Um, on social media, not just on what it is today, but also on what it can be or what it could be. We might claim ownership, tweak what social media is about and sort of create social media that will enhance this sort of cluster of uh, learning uh, concepts. And definitely uh, sort of look at uh, improper use of uh, current media as it, is, as it exists today. Road learning, okay, can we use social media to do that or not? How can we do it? Can we use Twitter to do it? Can we use Facebook to do it? Or should we, can we perhaps design a different type, a new type of um, social media that would help us to do that type of learning, all types of learning? Thank you. Interesting uh, talks, interesting introductions, but I, as an educator, still I can't find it. I didn't get the answer. Uh, what can I do with as an educator? Still, it, it's it's very confusing what, what everybody's saying. There's a, the one side of the story, then there's another side of the story. So uh, I put up uh, some uh, statements. You hear a lot uh, of possibilities, and uh, you, you all three uh, talked about that too. Uh, uh, collaboration, uh, I put it here as connectivism. But then Kurt showed also some results that uh, social media, Facebook, etc., Twitter use is not that positive. And sometimes you hear it's just an erosion of uh, attention. So it's, it's a distraction. Um, I, I'm an educator, and 
if I'm at a school or at a university or even as a parent, what do I have to do with this kind of, of uh, dilemma? Go ahead. Okay. For me, putting it that way as if it's either or, there's a fallacy there. If it's, as an educator, you, you have learning goals, you have standards, you have objectives, and that's where you start from. You're not looking, f you're, at least I'm when I'm working with my students, with my teacher students, I'm not starting from the social media. I'm starting, I'm starting from what do you want to do? Mm -hmm. And then that sort of... Um, I want uh, to use Twitter in my classroom. That's what I get as an answer uh, very often from teachers. No? Okay, but so then I, need, I think you need to break down that statement and really ask what is it you want to do? Okay. Using Twitter in your classroom is not a learning goal. I mean, it's not. No, I don't think It's so. really not. No. Okay. Somebody else who wants to respond? Well, I agree in terms of I am lacking. I'm, I'm thinking the same thing. Yeah. Uh, to, to put, to say, I want to use Twitter in my class. So what? what does, where does that bring you? I mean, you have to have a purpose. You have to have a reason. Basically, what reason. I'm saying yeah. is that your argumentation for uh, using Twitter or for bringing Twitter into your class must be sought through and must be, it, there must be a quite a, a sound rational for doing that. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to be aware of that and I think we have to talk about that. Okay, okay Kirsten. Oh, this is hard. You know, and from a human development point of view, Maybe neither of these goals, either constructivism or um, issues, are all that important. It might be age and um, personally dependent. So as you get older, whether we're off task or on task, it's a personal preference. As we're adults in the workforce, we go into informal environments and learn. That's our choice. And if, if social media sways us one way or another, that's our choice as well. When kids are under age five in Montessori schools, they're often pursuing their own choices as well. What schools do is take away the choices and take us back into getting us to focus on what they want us to focus on for the sake of the government standards and all sorts of other things and not really thinking about the human in the loop. And it's unfortunate the human in the loop is there from under age five and the human's back in the loop after you're age 30, but we've lost the human in between. So if we say that social media is pulling kids off task and we're eroding our mm, possibilities to have them to focus, who control, who's controlling that? Who's in charge? For what purpose are we trying to get them to focus? For some silly standard that someone's designed long ago or for something that's truly gonna make an impact? I didn't have an answer, I just came up with that. I was gonna pass. You wanna go to the next question, Theo? Here. It's a pity you all agree with each other. So <laughs> I'm going to give you some contradictory <laughs> things so that you can debate, right? Um, maybe my students are alien and you don't have this kind of students, but I teach pre-serve teachers. They're 20 years old and they are really resistant to mixing their personal lives and their personal profiles with their academic lives and they're not willing to use social media. And I also have many challenges in convincing parents that using mobile or social media is good for their teenagers. And my myself, I myself have a kid who is two and a half years old, and I don't think buying her a telephone. I think she should go to work when she's 18 years old, when she can afford her own mobile, and then she'll buy her own telephone, you know? Just to give you some thing that you can debate because you all agree with each other. I, I guess it's a good idea that we agree on we, with each other. <laughs> There's some value in numbers, even if it's just three. Um, no, but uh, what we do know is that both teachers and learners quite early in the process adopt multiple uh, online personalities, uh, identities. Uh, they typically have their, the one they come from, sort of the this, this, this traditional social one, 
very soon they sort of split off into a more professional one, more learning related one, more teaching related one, and then a more a highly private um, environment in which they only uh, allow uh, their, their inner uh, circle. So most people solve that question by themselves and there are some, some, some trends in that. Multiple identities, that's, that's what we see happening all the time. Well, I think I'd like to uh, propose that we think of social media, that we don't make it, make it such an issue. I know it has all sorts of potentials for, for things that we do not control or do not want to happen. But let's try to look at it as a tool in development of humanity. We have, for example, a hammer. A hammer? You know how to use a hammer. And I think that if we have, by the way, kids that have to learn the art of hammering, then we teach them and we, we, we go through the challenge. We don't beat around it. We don't uh, prohibit the use of it. We don't, I mean, I don't see that, uh, pro, uh, how do you say, not allowing people to, or to children also, I think we have to take them by the hand and go through the thing and teach them how to relate and use and be with this thing. Am I too I idealistic? At Indiana, we had the fifth largest teacher training program in the country when I started back in 1992. It's no longer the fifth largest. No one wants to major in teacher education anymore. Uh, thanks to the governors that we've had, the, the, the accountability system's gone way up and the pay has gone way down. We now have a vice president who comes from our state who's gonna be just as bad as our president right now. Um, sorry. What we've done in, at Indiana is many things for teacher training to get them interested in emerging technologies of all stripes. Um, looks like Mark's got a question, Teo, next. I see his hand up. Um, among, uh, we'll use this, yeah. Among them is modeling. You know, if you model as, as an instructor, you'll, you'll be showing them what's possible. So one thing you can do is model. Uh, one thing you do is bring back prior students who were doing social media the previous year to talk about how they might have been hesitant the previous year and how their attitudes may have changed. The best, the best convincers are peers. You know, but, but your modeling plus peers coming back, showcasing what they've done to put it up on the screen the first day of class. Instead of introducing the class, I bring back my prior students and they start my class. It's not me that's important. It's about what they're attempting to learn and what the, what the environment's going to be like. I'm trying to create that social environment, that collaborative engaging environment, um, that plane of uh, possibilities of flexible uh, learning to push them as far as I can push them and pull back when I have to pull back. Um, third thing you can do is to tell them that they don't have to publicize their social media. It can be a private thing. If they decide in the end to make it public, they can. They can still use social media. In fact, there's a tool I think called Group Tweet. The whole class can tweet without it being a public display. So it can be something that is classroom only. Um, and there are options within different media for that. And finally, at the end, the last day, I have students bring popcorn and we have movie night. They're showing their YouTube videos and whatnots that they've designed. If they want to show them, they can. If they want to do social media, they can. But I have 10 options. They can pick any uh, of those 10. If they, they want to do a social media assignment, they can. If they want to do something that's more traditional, they can. Giving them options in today's environment, there's so many things we can do, especially online, that um, I, I prefer a gradual approach, not force feeding, not forcing, but encouraging them through the examples of prior students and your own examples and maybe campus-wide examples. Okay, there's qu another question. It's, it's more a comment at the moment than a question because I go exactly to what you said. Um, I think you have to keep in mind the context of the usage because I think my identity is kind of prismatic. So in a way, I'm talking about research on Twitter, and in the other way, I'm talking about cooking researches. On, and um, I think when I was first on Twitter, the worst thing that could happen was my mom following me. So, and I think it would be the same with my professor, because I don't want the two identities to be mixed. And 
learning is about making mistakes or at least probing or leaving traces and in, on Twitter they are public. So maybe this is what hinders people to accept, to use Twitter in assignment-based conditions with their yeah, public, um, pu public acting um, where all the other people that are not interested in this side of identity still follow up. You know what I mean? Yes, but, but again, you can have multiple yeah. accounts, you can have multiple identities for specific purposes, different... Uh, not sure about that. The remark was that she wouldn't have the social capital uh, then. Uh, but I don't think you build your social capital in sort of a single cluster uh, of, of people. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm sorry. Okay, I think that even though we are, we can do almost anything with social media and post anywhere with anything and so on, uh, I think we, we have to remember that it's like um, with anything else, we have to, um, we are not free from, uh, how do you say, developing a good, um, ethically okay style of using the media. So I think that just because we are digital, we are still humans that need to respect these uh, borders of behavior. Go ahead, Mark. Okay, my, my point here is perhaps that um, we're kind of ignoring some important things in this discussion. Um, while we can all agree that, I think we can all agree that learning is social, and that to have real meaningful learning you need attention. But we're living in an attention economy, and many of these platforms are business platforms, where the, in your feed there's algorithms designed to take your attention away. They're designed to be addictive. So we can't really discuss social media as this neutral tool that we can use as edu educators. They're business platforms that are designed to take attention away from learning activities. So although I think they're great tools, and I've been a real advocate for using social media and open access tools, I'm also coming to become very concerned that there's something else going on here. Not, not just the data, not just the Cambridge Analytica stuff, but actually my little tweet or post to share resources is competing with the Donald Trump tweets and all the other things to get people's attention. I'd like your response to that. I love you, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Learning is social. We, you know, as many people have followed in Vygotsky's footsteps, maybe too many people have quoted from him, but um, you know, that's a concern of mine coming from the business world initially. I was a CPA in my previous life or an accountant and I'm working in a high-tech industry developing highly dense circuit boards and other things. And as I look at uh, the learning analytics stuff coming out of Gates Foundation and other places to try to pre-prescribe a learning environment and trying to condition people you know, I just read a paper for Ed Researcher. I just reviewed a paper for the Educational Researcher looking at uh, how these learning analytic approaches and all the new companies being started up are really taking us back to behaviorism in many ways. And it is a concern that we have learning management systems. You know, you just had your procession on learn LMSs. We're, we're in an age of freedom to learn, Carl Rogers, right? We're finally, finally approaching that, that time where the learner is free to learn whatever they want. You know, I got a 19 on the ACT. I couldn't get into Lower Potomac State University with that test score. That university doesn't even exist. I couldn't get into my own university today that I, I went to from undergraduate because now they require the ACT score. Back then they didn't. I could just graduate from high school and get in. You know, but today I can learn from MIT and Stanford and Harvard and I can learn from any place around the world. The world has become uh, open to learning. I'm going to interrupt you with your uh, age of freedom. Uh, that fits good with my next sta statement. Okay. Are we really, are we really that free? 
social media and yeah, let's call it the internet, create new, uh, or new job and world opportunities or in the near future we'll have big problems on our labor market because robots are coming and how, when I'm a student, uh, um, how can I keep up with it? How will I be attractive uh, uh, for the labor market uh, in the future? Do they still need that many students? Can I, like the lady said, uh, wait uh, giving my child uh, 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 a computer or uh, a device until he or she is 18? Isn't it too late then to have that kind of experience? Go ahead. I, I really don't have a, a very thorough uh, insight in, uh, in this, but to me, at least it doesn't sound as if this is sort of a, a problem created just by social media. Uh, this is a much larger uh, issue related to many, uh, let's say, megatrends, demographic trends, megatrends. Um, so I wouldn't sort of blame social media for whatever um, problem is hidden in that, in that uh, statement. But perhaps people in the audience feel otherwise. Okay, somebody wants to respond? But we know that we need new, different competencies uh, on the labor market in the future. We know that you have to have the digital skills or, you know, uh, information retrieval skills or wha whatever, uh, problem solution skills, etc. Uh, those are uh, new competencies that we don't have or not yet have and that we as universities or uh, institutes have to teach. But we don't do that. I think I'd like to try and answer that. Um, I think it's clear all over in our education system that the younger, the generations, the more they are comfortable with the digital media. I think we agree on that. And for example, in high schools or other places, I think we need to uh, not be so confined with our, in our uh, competencies, but be willing to learn from the younger generation, which is not necessarily the educated one. Maybe we think we are, or maybe we are actually in that other era. Um, but I think that this is a problem that is very outspoken, for example, in high schools where the teachers claim Oh, I don't like to, to be in the class because now, how can I do this? It's, I, I am embarrassed in front of my uh, uh, students and they know much better than me, what do I do? And I think there's only one way forward and that's to change the fixed idea about the teacher possessing the knowledge and giving it to the students. Okay. I think that but we but should be open. You know, uh, I see it uh, at least uh, in the Netherlands or in Germany, you see it at the universities, uh, uh, they don't do a lot uh, to, to make students employable. So employability is not even an issue. And I think it has to be an issue. No? Kurt. Yeah, there are some data, I think 57% of people or some more higher than that who are doing learning analytics in the workforce today had learned their knowledge from MOOCs, you know, and they're not getting it through the normal. So I agree with you that our educational systems are not providing the skills mm -hmm. that people need to be employable, but now there's these offshoots and these certificates and credentials, badges and other kinds of ways in which people are, are being reskilled and upskilled and so forth. This is a huge area of opportunity for us researchers to be looking at is an opportunity for all of us to make a difference in the world as we come uh, findings about the pr progress of people who've gone this alternative route to employment. That's a fascinating area to get people, I mean, the, the most fascinating thing we're doing is interviewing people whose lives have changed as a result of using open educational contents and resources and things of that matter. But should it come to that? Shouldn't universities and uh, vocational institutes and other places be thinking about being more proactive in designing programs that are shorter or more focused or whatever, or you know that are not requiring 36 master's credit hours, but maybe something shorter that we're seeing happening at Coursera and in these uh, specializations or at Udacity and so forth. Can't we get into that game as well? 
and then that's coming. So I, I agree. We're not doing fast enough. Jo the Georgia Techs of the world are, you know, are doing this, but not everyone is. So um, this is an interesting area, but it's a critical area because the jobs are mo rotating to places that we hadn't envisioned in the past, and it will continue to do so. And so uh, I, I agree. I'm curious what the audience thinks here. Yeah, I, I would like to follow your words saying about Israel, the, I'm from Israel, um, the Ministry of Education realized that MOOCs might be part of the answers and there is a national intuitive that uh, universities can develop MOOCs funding by the Ministry of Education. It's a lot of money and mm. we look forward to see maybe it will be part of the answer to what is happening right mm. now. Mm. I'd like to also say uh, a comment on that because I think it can also be approached the solution or can also be approached from a pedagogical point of view working with the PBL model at least the way we do it in interpret that in Aalborg we uh, let our students their final products and actually also every semester product they have to go out and find a collaborator a, a firm or something real life authentic one in society that they collaborate with and through has, have to base their uh, thesis on mm -hmm. so, so I have a last statement uh, and uh, we run out of time so uh, a quick comment on my last statement schools teachers and the educational system provide a safe haven in a chaotic world or we have to face reality teachers and schools are hopelessly outdated just real quick, I'm working on a book on MOOCs and open education in the developing world or the emerging economies. We're going to be working on that this summer at the Rutledge. If anyone has this, uh, I mean, I, I'm willing to accept one or two more chapters. If anyone's doing something interesting around the world, come see me. Uh, we might be able to include you in this book project. So we're about it, ready to get going. So. Yeah. Well, um, again, it was sort of in my introduction as well. I mean. We, we schools need to take more ownership. We're too much sort of looking at social media as if it is, as if it's something that's sort of out there and it's imposed upon us. And we, the only thing we can do is try to interact with it, react to it. We don't see it as something that we co-own, that we co-develop, that we co-influence, uh, co-create. And I think that's the way to go. Are we outdated? That's perhaps not the, the model. It's outdated still means that we're sort of trying to adapt to something that's out there. Um, for me, it's more about ownership, taking ownership. And then you're not, but perhaps, we're, so yes, I agree, we're not enough taking ownership. We need to do more of that. But does that make us outdated? I don't think that's sort of the, the right conceptual framework. Okay. Uh, ownership is the key and I think it counts for students and it counts for us. We have to be at the wheel when we drive the world <laughs> with diverse digital media and so on. Okay, right. thank you. Okay, good. Then uh, it's 12 o'clock, so lunch is waiting for us. I want to... One o'clock. Oh, one o'clock, I mean one o'clock and the lunch is waiting. I thank the panel for their insights and their thoughts about social media. Mm, we didn't solve uh, this problem uh, now within the hour, but uh, thank you very much for joining us and um, enjoy your lunch. Thank you, panel, Kurt, Elsbeth, and Kuhn. Thanks. Thank